Today we have an inspiring young lady from California who was diagnosed with a very rare bone disease. Let's welcome Sarah Elizabeth Mumper. Sarah, thank you once again for joining us on today's show. It is truly awesome having you here with us. And I'm sure for many others who are joining us today, I'm sure they'll be able to get some more inspiration from your story. So um, just so that you know, I'm just going to put this out there before we get right into it. So what I love and admire about you is the fact that despite your physical disability, you're still able to do the things that you love, you know, being able to go to concerts, Disney, travel, and all these amazing places. And, you know, it, it goes to show that embracing your disability has really changed your life. So I'm just wondering, how has your story shaped you to who you are today? Yeah, um, I really feel that uh, a lot has to go to my family <laughs> for making me into who I am. Um, a lot of my decision making and how I've decided to um, pretty much like go about my life is is how they've treated me and how um, their hopes and dreams for me have been. Um, one of the biggest things that they've always um, wanted for me was to make sure that I never felt limited in my um, dreams and what I wanted to do. Uh, they would always talk to me about how it's a matter of, you know, attitude and how I want people to perceive me and how I want to go about in the world. And a lot of times I have just seen people with disabilities who do have a harder time and it is really difficult to kind of break out of that mentality of, you know, the world's really hard on me, so I'm going to be hard on myself. Um, and I didn't see that as how I wanted to live. I wanted to do more of, I'm going to do what everybody else can do, but I'm going to do it sitting down. <laughs> you know, it's very inspiring hearing you say that because you know many people um you know different parts of the world they give up on themselves and they feel that oh because i have a disability you know life is over but you have shaped your life you found new ways of doing things and just making every day a new normal for yourself so that is very inspiring to hear and um you discovered you had this rare bone disease at what age um, when I was three years old. So my mom actually, my mom and dad went through the actual diagnosis process. Whereas I didn't really get to go through that until later down the road where I had to start accepting what my disease was. And until I actually understood what it meant and how it would affect me in my day to day. Wow. Well, and you know, having this disease at a very young age, it means you are surrounded by younger um, children, young adults. And, you know, some children, they're very curious and they ask questions that most adults feel very awkward asking. So did you ever experience those awkward questions from other children at, at a very young age? Oh, all the time. Um, I remember being in preschool before I had anything like mobility devices or anything like that. And just even my birthmarks, you know, kids would be like, oh, you have chocolate on your face. Or I've even had an adult say like, oh, honey, you got, you got chocolate milk dripping down. And it's just like, no, that's just my birthmarks. And very innocently, obviously not knowing anything different. Um, I strongly believe that education early on with kids um, makes such a difference. And I used a walker when I was five years old and I didn't want to be using it around my friends at school. I didn't want to show that I was different um, and feel out of place. Uh, my dad took me uh, to school that day and he asked the teacher and he said, hey, you know, Sarah has to use this now. Do you mind if I address the class? And she gave him the five, 10 minutes that he needed to just say, hey, do you guys know what this is? Kids raise their hand. Oh, my grandpa uses it. My grandma uses it. It oh, takes yeah. a lot of um, courage. It takes a lot of, um, you know, being strong within yourself and just having the right people around you to encourage you and motivate you and not make you feel any different from others. Uh, what would you say can be done better to 
improve the um, accessibility for anyone who has a disability? I, I would probably say um, just for especially businesses. Um, I know before I go out, I always have to like think about where I'm going and the accessibility that's there, especially if it's somewhere I frequent, it's, it's you know, second nature. I don't think twice about it, but mm. it is something where accessibility is different for everybody. Um, and so just having a business that is willing to be open um, about accommodations, especially if somebody calls ahead and asks specific questions of, you know, where are the bathrooms located? You know, do, do you have a large stall available um, at your location? Um, you know, what kind of seating do you have if it's a restaurant or things like that? Um, I do know a lot of people who have to call ahead at places that they go. I know one of the reasons why I had always been reluctant to travel abroad is because like for me coming from the US where we like the oldest place on the West Coast is, isn't all that old and really have been able to be adapted is so different if I were to go to Europe where things have been there for you know thousands of years and cobblestone streets aren't really my best friend, but you know, um, having to really plan, um, I do so much research from other people with disabilities who have traveled abroad and read their blogs religiously. So that way I know the places I can travel and go to. I know there's like beaches aren't really accessible to me. So I have grown to not really want to go to the beach unless like there's like a cabana that, that is right there on the on the edge of it where you know easy to get to not a big deal but other than that it's really hard and it's nice to see that public beaches are slowly starting to put alternative um kind of like uh pathways where it's easy for somebody who's in a wheelchair to go over oh, say if i start a new job having to make sure i ask the right questions to make sure accommodations um are in place I used to be very afraid to ask questions when going to a new job for the fear of, you know, they wouldn't want to hire me because I'm asking too much when in actuality I'm not, I'm just asking for my needs to be met. And so a lot of what I'm trying to do with um, like my website and, you know, what I'm trying to do with my social media is trying to help others build up that confidence through my own experiences and, you know, what I've been through or the, you know, obstacles that I've ran into going down the same path that they're going down so that way they can be prepared um, and trying to help combat a lot of those fears that they might have. But you know what? I love the fact that you have touched on, um, you know, workplace employment and all of that. And, you know, people with disabilities, they lack access to employment opportunities. And, you know, sometimes it restricts them from certain roles or certain um, career levels in their lives. So in your experience, because I believe you work full-time or part-time? I work full-time. Full-time. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. So in your experience, how has um, being disabled affected your career generally? I can tell you that I initially wanted to be in the fashion industry. Uh, I went to school to uh, learn fashion merchandising and I really wanted to work the marketing aspect of it. I have always loved fashion and loved the opportunities that could be presented for people with disabilities. Um, but it did open up my eyes to, okay, I do love the marketing aspect of it, but where can I implement that in another field? One of the big things that I've learned is as much as I would love to work in a field that I'm super passionate about, um, I also need stability because of just my own health care and my needs. And um, for me to continue to work full time instead of going to part time or needing some disability assistance, um, I need to continue to be active as I am and finding a job that meets my needs that don't overexert me in my day to day. I do have to say the biggest thing for me is finding a good work environment. It makes all the difference in the world. It doesn't matter what you're doing or if you love what you do, as long as you're in a comfortable and safe work environment that provides the necessities that you need to do your job and to feel fulfilled through your day, like 
that's enough. Absolutely. I totally understand that. And, um, you know, so on dating, I understand that you are in a relationship. You've been with your partner for how many years now? Um, it'll be three years in June. So wow. that's coming up. Mm -hmm. So nice. So how did you feel at first when you started dating? Because, you know, some people, they think that um, they are not worthy of being in a healthy and wonderful relationship and they feel that they don't deserve happiness or love or they also think that okay i don't you know some people they don't want to be bothered by someone who has a disability because they feel that um they're going to be faced with a huge burden you know having to look after them but it's not always the case is it yeah um i did not date at all when i was in high school mainly because I felt like I just, I already was struggling in school, so why would I have time to date? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, right. So it wasn't until I got to college that dating became a little bit more of an option for me. And because I hadn't had any real experience when it came to what does dating look like, um, what do I even want out of somebody in a relationship? Because of course we all fantasize like, oh, you know, my guy or my girl will have blonde hair or brown eyes or black long hair or, you know, whatever it is, we have this image, but like, of course it's never what you want it to be. And, um, and so I actually jumped into dating apps and I used that as a way to build my confidence into mm -hmm. dating. Um, I went to a lot of coffee shops when I would study or meet up with friends and got to meet a lot of people through just being a frequent um, regular at those different coffee houses. Um, especially when it came to the dating apps, I initially, when I would go on there, would not, uh, I'd put maybe one picture that showed that I had the wheelchair, but then I would put a couple where I would be standing because I want them to know mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a wheelchair, but like that's, I'm not wheelchair bound. But I had a lot of reservations because when I was younger, especially in high school, I didn't feel like I was capable of being in a relationship because I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to be as independent as I am or be able to do as much as I would want to, or if I would be preventing my partner from being able to do what they want. Um, those were a lot of things that, you know, just flooded my brain. Okay, does this person actually want to get to know me? And do they actually know what this means if we get into a relationship? And I got into my first relationship and it was a whirlwind, first love, everything that, you know, I feel was really good for me at the time. Um, I was going through a lot with my family. It was a nice distraction, but it was also a great learning experience because I really got to learn what I loved about myself in a relationship. Um, I got to learn how much I wanted my partner to help me um, and where to put those boundaries. Unfortunately, I was also still young and still didn't know who I was. And so there was a lot of conflicts in the sense of okay, I need to know now if you're in this for the long run, when in actuality, that wasn't the case. Um, and eventually, you know, it didn't turn into a great ending in that relationship. And we did end up uh, breaking up because mostly be, I feel like my insecurities of just how I felt that they would take on the responsibility of me living with my disability um, and I didn't want that to continue. And I got to kind of just have such a huge learning curve from that and just say, you know, I got to be unapologetically myself. I got to, I got to do what I want. I got to be who I am. Um, because there was a lot of times that I just, I felt like I settled and I felt like I settled with, you know, oh, because they love me, you know, I can give this up, which would be something as simple as going out with friends. No, like they do so much for me. I need to spend time with them and do this um, because they do so much for me. And that is something that I have strongly advised a lot of people that 
never settle. And I know some people, they feel that it's such a huge burden to be with someone who has a disability. And what they don't realize is that they have thought about so many reasons, the million reasons why it's not going to work, but they haven't really taken the time to, you know, think about, okay, it could actually work. And just as you said, you know, it's all about thinking to yourself, okay, you know what, am I in this for the long run or is it something that I can truly handle or do I really like this person enough to, you know, stick with them? And that is the most important thing. And I, I have to say, like being in this relationship, I limit myself more than he limits me because I mean, there are times where he's just like, yeah, like let's go camping over, you know, in Yosemite. And I'm just like, I don't know that I can really do that. And he goes, of course you can. And he's more of like the, no, we'll make it work. And yeah. it's a nice reminder. It's a nice refresher. Um, he like, when I tell him I want to be doing something more, he encourages me to do it more. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the biggest thing. Um, yeah. when putting yourself out there and when dating, just remember, like, have a partner that encourages you to do what you love, mm -hmm. who knows the healthy balance between pushing your limits, but not pushing you out of your comfort zone, um, unless it's a good comfort zone. Um, and so I, I mean, I would even say for people who are unsure about dating somebody with a disability, don't be afraid to ask questions. If you already have that relationship with that person as a friend and you want to take it to that next level, ask them, talk to them, um, having that conversation because otherwise there's going to be the constant fear in the back of your head and you're just going to, I mean, potentially it builds up resentment if you don't have those conversations because yeah. you feel like you're doing so much and you feel like you're turning into a care caregiver versus being a partner. I love that. And thank you for that, Sarah. That's been awesome. So is there any project at all that you're working on um, that would help others who have a disability and, you know, finding ways they can cope or deal with the challenges they might be facing? Yeah, um, I work with a couple of uh, different nonprofits. Um, one of them is uh, the Fibrous Dysplasia and McCune Albright Syndrome Alliance. Okay. Um, I've been doing a lot of volunteer work for them. It's specifically for people um, with FD, MAS, um, but they do have great tools um, on their toolbox for um, when you go to meet a doctor, taking notes, they have great tips. I do try to, um, my goal for my website is to eventually have resources like that um, for general disabilities across the board. Um, I myself um, help with just regular consulting um, on my website. I have free 30 minute consults with people um, who just need help navigating, whether it's the medical field here in the US, um, how to you know, go through the process of getting a new wheelchair, dealing with insurance, um, different things like that. Um, also through, you know, my Instagram page, I'm, you know, doing what I can um, to work with uh, different companies that um, advocate a lot for the chronic illness community. Um, I've been working with Mighty Well, who has these fantastic face masks that are comfortable, especially, you know, while we're still in the world of face masks and pandemics. Um, they have other products, um, whether it's adaptable backpacks um, for pick lines uh, to have like sleeves and stuff like that for your pick lines, different things like that. Um, and then also uh, the Magic Foundation. Uh, they do so much, especially for children and uh, um, their parents. It's a three day conference and it's actually coming up in July. I get to speak um, for my group, but all are welcome to come and listen. Um, the conference is for uh, growth hormone, uh, whether it's deficiencies or um, too much growth hormone, different diseases are represented. Um, if that's something that affects you, um, they do also have the option for other um, because they may not know just yet, but they're always um, adding to uh, the nonprofit for the different groups. And so you might just be the start to um, open up a new group for people. 
Awesome. That is awesome. Well, Sarah, it's been fantastic having you here on the show and you just sharing your personal story and, you know, sharing a powerful message of encouragement to many others who might be